And welcome back to the CIB presidential series. And we have uh, another great speaker today with us. And as you know, the theme for this semester is women researchers in the built environment. So continuing with that theme, today's speaker is Dr. Casey Faust. Let me give you a quick brief bio of her great achievements so far. So Dr. Casey Faust is an associate professor and John A. Faust Centennial Teaching Fellow in Civil Engineering in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research on socio-technical projects, primarily water sector infrastructure, aims to improve access to basic necessities for underserved communities. The provision of water is threatened by aging and decaying water infrastructure systems. Insufficient access, lack of funding for capital projects, workforce constraints, and of course, exposure to frequent and severe hazards. To address these urgent challenges, uh, she studies water infrastructure systems through a socio-technical systems, uh, and using that lens to improve the delivery of safe and reliable water services. Her work advances our understanding of resiliency and proposes novel physical, managerial, and operational solutions. Questions posed are impact-driven to support decision-making around critical and emerging challenges for sustainable projects, improved access, and equitable services. Through this work, she has published over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and proceedings. Her work has been widely recognized through numerous awards and recognitions, such as the ASC Daniel W. Halpin Award for Scholarships in Construction. Not to forget that Casey is also an alumni of Purdue University. So please welcome Dr. Casey Faust. Thank you. Um, so excited to be here and see everybody. And um, I started out as a uh, master's student here, and I came for a master's and stayed for a PhD and two masters and became a professor. So I like to call myself an accidental academic. This was not the path I was on, and I think I've got the very best job in the world, and I love what I do. And um, coming here to work with Dr. Abraham was probably one of those things that set me on that course, but I didn't realize how much I miss this place, so I've been walking around just with a big smile. Um, also, it's one of the first trips I've had without a two-year-old and five-year-old in tow, which is also helping my smile. Um, so today I'm going to talk about water service and something very near to dear and near and dear to me in Alaska. And I want to jump right in, but a little bit about me, you heard about that. Um, to give you some context is I did my bachelor's at the University of Washington, the greatest football team in the nation. We are going to be winning. I'm a diehard Husky fan. I bleed purple and yellow with football. Um, and then I came to Purdue University for one master's degree and never left. Met my husband here. Uh, and stayed here five and a half years and ended up moving down to Texas after that to become a professor. And I said, I'm going to try it out for a year to see if I like it. And I fell in love with the career and have never left. Um, I really, I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And you, if I'm not working, you can usually find me outside doing something, whether it's camping, hiking, whatever it is. I also love traveling. Um, I try to take my, my four-year-old has been to 12 countries. He keeps a tally. Um, so I find a lot of reasons to do projects around the world that I can drag my children with me to field work. And so it's been really, really fun. Um, and these are my two tornadoes right there that uh, keep me busy in my free time. So um, I'm going to go over this really fast because it, I was in the introduction, but essentially my work looks at ca capital projects and how we put them inside of communities. And one of the problems when we move from technology to practice is they're not sustainable and they don't align with the community needs. So our capital projects fail and they're uh, in the long term. Our technologies fail because we don't look at the capacity of the community, the supply chain, the workforce constraints and things like that. And um, I found that when I was doing my PhD, we started realizing that we could optimize systems. But when you go and put them in communities, the people there would say, well, of course, this is how we're going to do it, but we can't get it in. It's not going to get approved by the gatekeepers. It's not, infrastructure is not sexy. It's, not, it's long term. We can't see it. Um, end users don't want us to do that. And so I started realizing that 
all of our really good solutions and our engineering on our engineering challenges were being inhibited by the fact that we weren't stopping to understand the context that we were placing these systems in. So my whole career has been built off this that we really need to understand our engineered systems in that situational context. And we need to build in those things like our policy constraints. Anybody, civil engineers like to think that policy doesn't impact us, but the very codes that we use to design our buildings, our water regulations, those fundamentally are policies that are telling us how our systems can operate and how we design to. And so we need to build these into our thinking. And so we started taking a more of a systems view of the lens, and that's what my research group does. It essentially looks at this idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We need to look beyond the engineering system and actually start building in these interfaces with where it's played and where it's placed, because at those interfaces is where our vulnerabilities lie, whether our workforce can maintain it, whether they can um, operate it, whether we have the supply chain to fix something when it breaks, things uh, so as basic as that. So I've been doing this work all over the world um, for the last eight years. I like to, like I said, I like to look at very unique operating contexts that our systems typically aren't designed to operate in, but they're placed in. So I like to see why are these failing and how can we come up with different solutions that align with the community needs to get these systems up and working better and get our built environment to serve the people that it's supposed to. And so we're gonna be focusing on one of my recent um, studies, which is in Alaska. So we've been doing work in Alaska through a few projects for the last, I want to say three years now, and we've got about four more years of work right now lined up, looking at capital projects in rural Alaska in the villages. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, because it really shows the tensions between the situational context and our Western systems that we have built and designed here. And the reason why this is near and dear to me is because I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. And so right up here is the house that I grew up in in Anchorage and right and that's right here and then down the street just a couple miles was where I spent all of my time and that's where all my friends were in the trailer park. And so the people that I grew up with that were in my school um, were primarily lived in this trailer park and just a couple miles away it was very apparent the inequities of the, sp uh, uh, the spatial inequities of our services and our built environment just by going up the road we may or may not have hot water. We may or may not have water in the winter. The insulation of the, of the trailer is different. There might not be a lock there. Just a, and that's just two miles down the road, same school, same community, same everything. So these, so these inequities that different people in our own cities face was made immediately, immediately transparent to me. And that didn't seem right to me, that why should somebody on the same system, two miles away, same, um, same school, same, same road, have such a vast differences in the level of service. And when we look at the ASCE code of ethics, how many people are engineers here? And so we all abide by a code of ethics. You'll notice that most of this is talking about the people we serve. They're not about the engineered systems, they're the people we serve. So right here, engineers first and foremost protect the health, safety, welfare of the public. We want, we're looking at the quality of life. We are looking at treating all persons with respect, dignity, and fairness. Uh, we, need to, we need to build in and acknowledge the diverse, historic, social, cultural needs of the community and incorporate this into our work. These are all things that are in our code of ethics that we say we're gonna do as engineers and sometimes we forget because so we think we're just designing the system. We need to consider the limitations and capabilities of the current emerging technologies. Do they align with the community or what the community wants? Can they actually support them? A lot of times we think that we're bounded by just the numbers in a vacuum, but we forget that if we look at our code of ethics, there's nothing in here that says you got to design something really well and that's it, full stop. And so, the, uh, so this is really when we say we're operating as civil engineers here, we need to really consider. And so going to Alaska, these green places are all of the jurisdictional boundaries of, uh, in Alaska. They're called places there. So we, we might think of them as counties or other things or boroughs, but um, they call these places. So these are all over Alaska. You can see some of the hubs of like uh, populations here. And as you go out farther, yeah, um, you see fewer and fewer. Now, when we talk about water infrastructure, these are the number of places that actually have statistically decreasing access to water infrastructure in their house. These are American citizens that have less access to water infrastructure from one year to the next. We like to think that in America, everybody's increasing access. Everybody has infrastructure. Everyone has the basic water. I mean, the UN says it's a humanitarian right, but we have places in America that have less, people have less access. They don't have plumbing in their homes from one year to the next. 
Their built environment is accessibility is decreasing statistically. So right here is the number of places, and you'll notice there's quite a few red ones there. So if we zoom in from the, uh, the region that has the most decreases, that's the YK, the Yukon, Kuskokwim Delta region. They have over 30 unserved communities where 45% or more of the homes are not served by in-home systems. That means they don't have premise plumbing in the house. There's honey buckets, they might have tanks for water, things like that. Um, this leads to extreme ser uh, service gaps. This, well, this leads to extreme water conservation, um, water quality issues, uh, public health things, a lot of health disparities, because you know why we have our built environment is for the economic uh, livelihood and well-being of our communities. And so there's a lot of people, there's a lot of American citizens that are being served here inequ or inequitably. Why is that happening? We wanted to know. What's going on? And so this is why we started this project a couple of years ago. We said, you know, as an engineer, and I like to think that I know a whole lot about socio-technical systems. I spent a good, you know, decade, 15 years doing this. And I was like, you know, why, why is this going on? So before we wrote our first grant to go out there, I said, I'm going to do a map to understand the factors that are impacting the level of water infrastructure service in Alaska. I grew up there. I'm an engineer. I like to think I'm pretty objective, but, you know, so I'm going to put this together. So I'm the engineer that I did that. I abstracted the architecture of the system. So I wanted to know how all the factors interacted together that led to the provision of service. Because real quick, we understand the factors and how they fit together. That gives us different levers in different places that we can pull to try to cascade to impact the level of service. If we can impact something like the supply chain logistics, that can go through the system, for instance. So I did this, and then I went to one of our community's outreach specialists, and they're like, oh, no, no, if you got it wrong, you're missing a whole lot of factors there. They started to say there's a lot more feedback going on. I was like, okay, so this is why we need to work with more people, right? Look at that. Look at how many things we're missing. The skills and training of the workforce, institutional knowledge, the, so the dynamic climate change environment, and the strategies that are emerging around that, the remote location, um, and the feedbacks between that that, were, that I didn't have in there. And then we're like, okay, you know, you and I, we're both Alaskan. We got this. Now we're, now we're set. So we took it to somebody else. Uh, and we said, what are we missing? I said, you're forgetting about the cultural relationship with water and the expectations of service. You're forgetting about the uh, indigenous populations and how the water use is different from there. And there's different expectations. There are, there are communities that use one to four gallons per capita per day versus 90 per capita per day, which is average in the lower 48. And I was like, oh, OK, so we do need to consider the local history. For instance, a lot of these, these communities were transient or nomadic. And then post-World War II, for a lot of um, post-colonial reasons, became um, stationary. And a lot of infrastructure was built around there. So there's a change in history also in where, how the infrastructure was built and how the communities used to operate versus now that we had to build into our understanding. So we went there, and we decided that we were going to really start to unpack why these communities were unserved. And we found out, uh, we didn't even really know what the questions were, or the factors were objectively, so we started building these maps to understand this um, with the communities after we had our base one. And what some of the things we found out is that like finances are directly tied to these unserved areas. There's not a lot of cash economies. Our Western systems depend on cash economies, right? That we pay for our services, but if there's not a cash economy and that's not the way the communities operate, how do we support these revenue-based systems? There's not a lot for O&M funding as such. Um, and there's a lot of really high costs. So if we look at something like supply chain constraints that can impact that high cost of construction out in places where you can't get equipment. You can barge in some small equipment maybe in the summertime, but usually most of your stuff is done by manual labor because you don't have equipment out in the tundra. And then once we look at that, there's insufficient funding for capital projects as it is, much less if you're doing it by hand and you don't have the local materials to do it. And that can lead to just not having projects. It's too hard, so they don't do it. They fail or they get start getting built and then they stop. And then we can look at things like climate change. This is a lot of people call Alaska the climate canary. In the last couple of years, the, uh, the permafrost has thawed to the point where it is no longer structurally stable. So communities are confined to the boardwalks in the summer, which I'll show you shortly. So we have climate change, which causes our systems to degrade faster. And then from there, we have high operational costs also. And that leads to unaffordable costs per household for communities that already can't afford water as is. So when we look at some of these communities, we see situations such as this, where we actually see that building is about eight degrees pitched to the side. 
They're frantically trying to build a new water treatment plant before it collapses. And there's a sign on the door that says no children allowed. Why do you think that says no children allowed? Could fall in. They don't want children in there because there's a risk of collapse. The doors don't shut. Things are constantly having to re-weld it haphazardly because things are breaking. But they're trying to limp along until they can get this new one built by the USDA on our melting permafrost. And so if we look at our, this right here, I'm about to show you some videos that um, show you one of the communities you're working on. This right here, do you see, can you guys see my cursor? So right here, this is a gate and there used to be a fence around this. This is the pipe that went to the other side of the river. They did that to keep kids out because there used to be permafrost that you could play and run on year round. In the last couple years, it's no longer there. That gate was how people accessed it. Now, they used to have this large pipe that was essentially braced to the ground, but then their permafrost melted. So what do you think happened to the pipe? Started breaking, right? Like, because it starts pitching and freeze and thawing and bouncing. And so now they've had to pretty much undo the braces and you know the pipe is at whatever angle it is at that moment in time. So you may or may not be able to get water to the other side of the community. So give me a second, this is gonna be, let me get this up. Let me see this. Um, let me actually new share so that I can get the sound. Give me one second. So. Oh my gosh. So they're talking about how he's got it. This is how he fixes it. Do you see that pole he's holding? Can they repair so he knows if he can step there. Let me show you another one. How do you have the Where is the next one? This is outside the water treatment plant, another part. <laughs> this is what we have to deal with. It's getting worse year by year. Kind of hard to see with the lag, but can you see how it's bouncing oh a little bit gosh. like jelly? It looks like a sponge. So this is what we're building on. And that's and then in the winter when it freezes, you're at the mercy of however it freezes. And this is a causing a lot of really interesting challenges. But when we look at I'm going to get to that shortly. I'm getting a slide ahead of myself. So we started looking, going to these communities, working with them and saying, okay, before we don't want to come into your community and tell you the problems and solutions to problems you never had. We want to co-design them. So we started working with them and said, okay, what are the challenges for water services? I can tell you what I think they are, but I want you to tell me because you are this is lived experiences. You know these day by day. And through all of this mapping and these structured um, focus groups I showed you on the previous slide, we found a lot of this was around operator training challenges and knowledge and service gaps as such. Our Western systems expect an engineer or somebody trained as such to run these. But if there's a sixth grade education, you may have challenges having that knowledge base, as well as your ability to certify operators, which opens up different funding mechanisms for you. Also, you have a lot of challenges with subsistence living. In rural Alaskan communities, you leave for moose hunting system season because that is your family's food for the winter fishing season, you're gone. So how do who's going to run the plant then? Local knowledge is not taken into account for water management. We expect everyone to be able to operate with our Western engineering knowledge when there's no formally trained individuals out there or workforce to support it. So there's this huge misalignment. People will think that smart sensors, for instance, are the answer to a lot of this. And then something, one of them will go off and somebody's going to get annoyed and they just turn it off and um, call the remote, the remote monitoring in the hub community. And it's like, hey, I just turned off your sensor. Something's going on. And that's it. So they don't want to deal with it. They're going to go off for it. They, they just leave it. They break it because the beeping's annoying. It's very interesting. So when we talk about what this means for public health, there's a lot of issues. The permafrost is melting, so we no longer have an impermeable layer. So the community is now confined to the boardwalk during the summer. The boardwalk's also failing in a lot of places because you can't, re there's a lot of sinkholes. So I bring my kids almost everywhere on field work. They were not allowed to come out with me on these villages because I could not make sure that they would stay on the boardwalk. And like there are, I mean, like it's not like you have to know where you're stepping because those can go real deep. Air quality is a concern with the permafrost thaw. 
Uh, we also have one of the big challenges is we have wastewater lagoons that were built there with the expectation that there was an impermeable layer that existed that's pretty close to the well. And now those are melting. So now we have surface water also intrusion from the well that was not there because that was never a problem. And they moved the lagoon previously, but uh, it's still there. And that's actually based on how, what is going on with the water flow or the lagoon is how far people have to go for water. They, whether they, they've determined whether they go two or three lakes over based on water flows and what the permafrost is doing for how far they have to go to get what they consider um, collected water. Uh, this creates a lot of challenges in um, water supply for quality and trusting it, as well as it creates a lot of multi-generational housing that wasn't, didn't exist before because the houses are collapsing. There's no place to build new houses, so they're forced into multi-generational housing that was never intended to be multi-generational housing, either structurally or culturally. And so now that's, became, that's uh, emerged a whole different community, uh, a whole different expectation of services and what we can do which has really been interesting. Ultimately, the infrastructure is crumbling and there's an furthering the inability to provide services and furthering the challenges. Because when you're out here in this particular community, you might be able to barge in a little bit of equipment, but where are you gonna store it? People do this by hand, everything's by hand. They just store, they demo a building. My favorite is right here in the background, this is the post office, but they have to have it ADA accessible so the ramp goes right into one of the rivers because it just has to be there. Um, anyway, that's a, it's a, there's a lot of challenges like that. So what, essentially we decided we were gonna for, focus on the workforce levers because they said that was their biggest challenge. How do we run these systems if we don't have a skilled workforce ef effectively? We don't have an operator that is certified. We, doesn't, we don't have um, the ability to open up funding for capital projects, to do this as the day to day. So the first thing we want to know is like, does it actually really matter if you have a certified operator or is it just something we've always done? So we actually started looking at um, how important it was first. So we wanted to make sure that like, if we were going to pull this lever, we wanted to make sure that this was a lever, this was worth it. So we started looking at health-based violations. We don't want to look at monitoring violations. When we look at water systems, we have two types of violations. And we wanted to make sure these, um, these operations and maintenance suggestions that we had were empirically rooted. So we need to know if this was actually a statistical problem. So monitoring violations happen a lot because of the supply chain. Like a plane doesn't come in, so they can't get the water sample to the, to the lab, for instance. Or the we they're weathered in for a week and they miss the deadline. So we didn't want those, right? Because that doesn't tell us if there's actually a problem in the system. It could be a lot of supply chain stuff that's really hard in rural Alaska. Um, so for instance, when we go out to this community, we have to be ready to stay for a week if we get weathered in. Like we can't have our plane trip after that because it's very possible. So we looked at health-based violations and said, why are these occurring and can we actually determine if a workforce is happening? So these are from 2020 because this is the last time that they had them compiled for this. And these are the health-based violations by percentages across Alaska. And these are the, uh, the number of operators with some level of certification. I say that because a lot of operators, if they are certified, aren't certified to the level of their system because it just takes so many hours to get certified. And if you can support your operator 10 hours a week, because that's all you can afford and you need 2,500 hours to certify, you're probably not gonna hit that, right? So there's some real challenges around that. So if you had any level of uh, certification, we wanted to know. And ignore the model. All you need to know is what's in orange. Small water systems, um, small water systems were less likely, they were a little easier to manage. And uh, if the operator had any level of certification, they were less likely to have a violation. So if they had any level, so not having a certified workforce yeah, that was a problem. So we said, okay, how do we actually move forward um, to find out what operators need to know? And how do we get them that information in a way that's accessible for people who are not trained formally and will not be trained formally? And if you only have one operator, you can't take them to Anchorage to um, get trained for a month because who's going to run the system? It's a huge, huge problem. Um, and so that's what we've been really doing is we've been looking at how do we co-design more effective operation maintenance of water infrastructure. And we are, we are challenging the assumption that you have to have a formalized certified Western um, delivered education. We're saying, how do we look use some of this local knowledge to try to fill in the gaps so it's better than before? Because this is the reality of that situation. So we spent a lot of time in our communities interviewing, shadowing, and observing because we wanted it to be rooted in local knowledge. So we spent a lot of times going back and forth between in Alaska. My students go back about twice a year. I go back 
uh, every other year ish um, or whenever I need to for those. But they've been spending they've been living in Alaska every chance they get. I mean, anytime I'm telling them that they can go for a month, they're out. They're out the door. They love it. So, for instance, this summer, they spent, they conducted 24 interviews with water sector professionals around the region. Um, they conducted 150 interviews with end users. So talking to the people receiving them, because when you don't have a certified workforce, your end users are working as human sensors and operation and maintenance by default, because they have to repair their own pipes. They have to thaw their own pipes. They have to put filters in their water if they see it coming and run. So they are working as proxy operators and engineers. So we had to talk to them too, say, what are you doing in your houses when this happens? Who's fixing this? Shadowing. You know, we want, so we, one of my students got up every morning and sat in the truck with the, uh, with the water hauler. So here's something I forgot to mention. In Alaska, we have three types of water service, which you'll see this show up in a little bit. We have natural water provision, so packed ice. People go and chip ice in the winter and collect rainwater in the summer. This is the preferred consumption method. Anybody can guess why people prefer natural water as opposed to treated water for consumption? Yeah. They don't trust the source. Keep going about that. They don't trust the source. Why would they not trust the source? What makes them not trust the source? I don't like the taste of chlorine. <laughs> they think that the chlorine is a problem of every health thing, culture, uh, every health problem. It's a big public health issue in terms of um, uh, education and outreach they've been doing in communities for years. But fundamentally, that's, a, that's not our challenge. Our challenge is how do we make water safer? So we know that people are preferring rainwater and packed water for consumption, and they use all other water for washing dishes, everything else. Two types of water that's treated. We have pipe systems and we have hauled systems. Pipe systems, as you might guess, in communities like this don't work very well um, because where are you putting the pipes? Right? They have to be above ground, and they're very expensive very expensive to build. So a lot of them are in hauled systems. So in a, this community, well, this community right here, the hull, this is the water um, delivery that go, they come and once a week, they top off your tank, 100 gallon tank. And in, um, in uh, the other community that we were in, they use four wheelers or ATVs, some people call them, and the, or snow machines in the winter to deliver water to houses or else it's uh, for 100 gallons, it's $30. Or else for much cheaper, you can go pick up your own water at the, wa at the watering point. So it's very, very expensive, right? And so my students well, rode along for hours at 5 a.m. to deliver to see what was going on. And these people who are delivering water only have CDL training, but they are makeshift operators for the system because that connection point is a big um, contamination challenge. So we learned a lot about how why the turnover was so, hap was, uh, so heavy. And then we also talked with city leadership and community activities because we needed to know where everything was. And what we found was that we did a bunch of qualitative analysis. And for people who are not for, um, don't know about this, I stuck this in so you would know it's a great method to, to objectively look at text. One of the big things, one of my big qualms is a lot of times, especially um, construction engineering, we do a lot of human factors research and we don't do qualitative analysis correctly. We listen to an interview and we take down some notes. That's an objective because we're hearing things. We're looking for what we want to know and we're, we're viewing the world through our proxy view and it's not rep replicable. So we do a lot of qualitative analysis, which makes sure that like if another researcher does this, they can produce the same results. So from this interview, for instance, having less turnover among operators would fix a lot of things. When I look at a functional water systems in the region, most of those are in ones that have long-term water plant operators and a backup, right? These people know their job inside and out. From here, we can talk about what it takes to be a successful operator, retention, continuity of skills. We can start pulling out factors. And then we can start mapping these factors. And this is how we created those other maps. So we map relationships from these conversations. And we say, OK, if we, need, we, wanna, we want to retain operators for that institutional knowledge. Well, from these interviews, we find out we need more hands-on training because there are no training that are uh, relevant. Even the certification doesn't make sense. It's for systems in the lower 48 that, have no rel or, uh, or that are not at all relevant to the ones in their communities. So they just have to do it for the certification. There's, there's no alignment. Um, sense of responsibility. If people feel a duty to their community, if I don't do this, nobody else will. They had, they had a ten tendency, that tendency to stay. If we have more operators right here, we have more operators available. So this plus and minus are the relationship between these factors. So hands-on training, more hands-on training, more uh, operator retention. That positive means they're changing together. Negative means they're inversely proportional. Um, yep. Less 
uh, operator certification uh, or, or less certification needs, we will have, we'll be able to, or removing those barriers, we'll be able to increase the operator retention. So we're able to do this and start saying, okay, if operators are a crux, workforce are our crux, let's look at how this all fits in and all these factors. And what these do is this gives us all of these levers to pull that can cascade. So instead of just focusing on one thing, saying I'm gonna fix this one part of the system, we say, why don't we try to hit a couple small things that are manageable in lots of parts and see how they compound to come together. These are doable. Instead of doing this overhaul, let's do a couple small things that are um, that we can cascade towards a provision of services. And this fits in around workforce into a larger map. This is a little overwhelming, so we're just gonna focus on a few today. And we're gonna first talk about the hauler training. They have a huge retention problem. Hauler, water haulers who are critical to communities are leaving because of the hours, the work, and the lack of training. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know when they're gonna get in trouble. They don't, all they have is their CDL and they're sent off on their first day. There's no formal training. So we talked to them and we said, you guys want some formal training? They're like, yeah, but it's gotta be something really easy to read. It's gotta be something accessible. And we knew that the traditional training wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to work. Because what happens when we have, uh, when we have um, haulers that are not trained well is they miss houses, there's a lot of contamination, there's a lot of problems. They're very critical workforce in the system for operating the system. So we said, okay, let's talk about our hands-on training here. So we started looking at how we can increase um, the training. So this critical portion of, of hauled systems were um, felt more supported and they might stay a little bit longer. The turnover might be less, we can reduce their burden. So we essentially, based on these maps, we were able to identify these lever points and go to the communities and say, is this, is this what you see? Is this what you want? And they said, yeah. And so we came to the community, um, we came to the idea with the community members that we should do graphic guides. How many people have heard of graphic novels? So graphic novels are storytelling panels, characters, range of art styles. Um, it's a way that you get a lot of teens these days to read. Uh, they didn't have them when I was a kid, but they have them everywhere now. We also have other ones like graphic guides or storytelling, but less text than a graphic novel. There's characters, they convey information. We also have things like infographics that convey information. They're very text heavy, they stand alone. Um, and that this led to us to ours that were at the very beginning. These are ones that were generated by AI just to give us an idea of what we could do with these. And we would talk to them and what we're doing right now is creating a manual that walks through the day of a water hauler. It tells the story of when you arrive at the plant all the way through your routes to when you turn the plant, when you turn the truck back in. And we're working to actually design this to represent the people who are working. So here's something that you need to do year round. These are our early sketches by our undergraduate research assistant that is just doing amazing stuff. She's taking like these really awful AI images that you know the water pipe is coming out of the mountain um, and turning them into something that's very relevant for the community. And we're gonna work with some local artists as well. So it represents the people on the ground and their knowledge. And we're co-designing this with people sitting down with the water haulers. They are the one, they're using us as a conduit to get, tell us what information they think is valuable. And so we also, here's what you need in the summer. How do you prepare for the summer, for instance? Here's what you might need for the winter. And so we're going through the whole day. These are just some early sketches. We're gonna have a, and we're hoping by the end of the semester, we have a full, um, full graphic novel sketch. And then we're gonna be going out. My students can go out there and sit down with water haulers. We're gonna make sure it's sound and correct. And then we're going to test it. So we're pretty excited about this. So we're removing the, engineering from it and to giving it the information that they need in an accessible manner that doesn't take time, that they can just skim through. Now, the next step, one of the things besides that, we're also gonna be doing an end user guide because believe it, remember I said end users are critical for the system. A lot of the problems are because the end users aren't set up for tanks. They don't, they've got cars in the way. They haven't prepped their tank for their pickup or their delivery or not their deliver, their water delivery or anything like that. And so we're actually creating a graphic guide style magnet that goes on there that says, here is your date, here's what, here's your checklist. Have you moved your car? Have you cleared the debris from your thing? And creating a magnet for the fridge for the end users, the same thing to remind them like, don't forget, you want the service to happen. This is what needs to happen. And so what we found out, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we also found out the national operator certification is a problem. And we're working with the state to look at how we can realign it because the state determines it and they don't need to adopt the lower 48. They use the EPA one, but they're looking at doing um, ones that more align with the system. So we're working with them on the side, but the hands-on training is a lot more fun to talk about. So 
Uh, one more little thing I wanted to talk about in that space is, you know, as we work with the end users on how to maintain your tank, because they are critical, they play critical functions in the ability to provide adequate services, we needed to understand why people were using wet water and what was going on with the tanks. Turns out there's not a lot of stuff that's done in tanks in Arctic, Arctic environments when your tank is sitting insulated outside or in a 100 degree room that is behind a wall that you can't ever clean. Nobody knows what's going on with them. It's just kind of this black box. So we said, you know, what's your problem with your service right now um, in the community? And right there, there's three different types of service I told you. So we have the orange is our um, hauled users, the blue is our piped users, and the gray is uh, people who primarily use traditional sources such as packed water or rainwater. So a lot of people didn't like the appearance of water. A lot of people hated that taste of chlorine and they talked about it a lot. And that's why they would use the traditional water, for instance vice versa. And they didn't like the smell. They said they could smell chemicals. They could smell the treated water. They wanted the natural water. That's culturally what they aligned with. Um, and they had a problem. They didn't trust the water in the tank. So we found a lot about um, that a lot of the regulations and research overlook hauled water systems post delivery. And once it's delivered, they just say, OK, when we delivered it, it was adequate. But there's a lot of problems with that in terms of if you just topped off your tank, you have water that's been sitting there for who knows how long, right? You have some residual issues. You don't know how long the residuals are. Do you ever actually turn the water over in your tank? Do you ever clean your tank? Not typically. How do you clean it if it's behind a, if it's behind a wall that was built into your house, right? It can be a lot of problems. There's no guidance on how long that water can sit in there. And if we wanted people to function as engineers for that, the endpoints, we needed to make sure our research was empirically grounded. So we spent a whole summer doing a giant water quality campaign with some, well, I obviously did not lead this. I look at the physical infrastructure, but I was working with um, my colleague, Lynn Katz at the University of Texas, and she ran the sampling campaign to say, okay, we need to know what's going on with tanks and we don't know, to make sure that when you make a suggestion about O&M and how people operate and maintain and when they need to replace their tanks and um, where this funding is going around hauled systems, it is empirically grounded that we're, yes, we're, we're trusting the views of people, but we need to verify it a little bit, right? Kind of like we did at the beginning with that statistical test around uh, violations. So from this, we found there were uh, 93 interviews with end users, 97 samples this summer. And then we worked with um, the Office of Environmental Health to follow up with people who we had um, some health-based violations come up. They followed up and to find out where they were. Turns out a lot of them were in the tap. So it wasn't the tank, it was in the tap because those taps never get cleaned. So there's a lot of coliform, things like that. Um, so we, you know, here's just some of the indicators, basically a pretty thorough test to understand what is going on in that tank because that built environment is supporting the delivery of that water. We are responsible for that and how we operate and maintain that determines whether the quality is still received at the tap well. We know when it comes out of the water hose uh, there, it's okay. But once it leaves the water hose, we don't know what happens. Um, from that, we did a whole lot of testing. The house that we had in the summer was completely turned into a water lab. They had a blast. And why this matters is because it tells us how we can use funding. The Infrastructure Jobs Act um, has a lot of funding available for Alaska, $7 billion for Alaska infrastructure across water and wastewater. But most of the proposals are to expand piped water system, which is not going to happen in a lot of these communities. There's not really any conversations about what do we need to do for hauled systems. So we are working with people to try to provide some guidance and some empirically based knowledge on how we need to spend some of this money on capital projects. And I'll give you an example of <laughs> this is I can't believe this happened. So I was in I was reading New York Times last year and uh, the administer, Biden administration talked about about seven or eight communities that were getting relocated with funds um, in rural Alaska to because of climate change like there. One of those is one of the communities we're in. And I was like, there's no way that they're getting relocated because um, they're building a brand new water treatment plant right where they say they're relocating, the USDA is. So like literally, the one that I showed you earlier, that community, they're building a brand new plant. Said, you're not going to build a plant of this price on melting permafrost for your community to relocate upriver. That is not happening. And so like, there's, there is... Um, some funding confusion on capital projects and what needs to happen in these communities. So we're hoping that some of our conversations can illuminate that. And we're, we're talking to people um, at various scales all the way up to federal uh, to try to use some of this guidance and get it out as fast as we can. 
Um, and we're also trying to give this back to end users. We want them to be able to manage their systems better, give them their specific results and solutions, how often you need to clean your tank, when you need to replace it, should you make it more accessible or not? How do you actually clean a stored tank? How, how do you test it? And we're working with the local regions to disseminate this information. That's one thing is we never want to go around them. We want to work with the things in place and the agencies in place. So this is working with so many different players and it's been real fun. But when you have a project, when you have the built environment, it is constrained and operated by agencies and organizations. And so we need to make sure that we are aligning with their capacity to be able to put these in place. Because once our project's gone, there, we lose our ability to support some of this, right? So ultimately, my takeaway, and I can't believe I actually am finishing this on time, guys. I never finish talks on time, um, is that to understand these capital projects in the built environment, you need to not just look at that physical system, which is where we typically look as engineers. We like to assume away everything else. But if you actually want it to work, you need to look at the social system and those you're serving and what their needs are. You need to look at the financial system because funding speaks. Our capital projects don't happen if they're not funded. And we also need to look at the natural system like climate change, as well as changing source water quality, natural disasters, whatever it is. We need to know where they're embedded because that's gonna change the vulnerabilities and resilience of these systems and how we build them and what makes sense for a community. So if we wanna understand capital projects that best serve our community, we need to really understand the full system and how these are interacting. And in rural Alaska, this is stuff like limited cash economies. This is stuff like climate change and Arctic weather, difference in preferences. Difference is uh, the fact that we have small, tight-knit rural communities. One community we're working with says it doesn't say they want more treated water because they don't for um, consumption. They say we want more treated water so we can flush our toilet more. They want unlimited water. We hear that unlimited water. So, with this. I've been really lucky to work with so many people. This work I get to do through amazing individuals, and I'm really I've been supported um, by so many people. Uh, and I, my husband has been critical in allowing me to do this work by making sure I never away from my kids too long. He comes with me on almost all my field work and watches them while I'm away and when I have them in my backpack. So I've been really, really lucky that I've gotten to do this work. And I, I absolutely think that we have the best job in the world, that we get to ask these questions, these really challenging, wicked problems, and we get to go try to address them. And it's such a gift. But I want to leave us on this slide. This, uh, this work that I'm showing you is funded through three different NSF projects, the Navigating the New Arctic Program. And they're enabling us to really put into play the code of ethics for the uh, Society of Civil Engineers. I truly believe this. We need, to, and we need to be good stewards of the built environment and good um, stewards of engineering. And to do that, the code of ethics, ASCE, has, um, has made it so clear that they've codified the fact that when we serve communities, we need to consider the community. It is such a big portion. If you've read the new code of ethics from a couple years ago, it is the first thing up front. If you look at that, engineers, all of that quality of life, um, service and civic affairs, treat all people with respect, dignity, and fairness, diverse historical, social, cultural needs of the community. You need to consider this in their work. And we need to consider those capacity of the community to support what we're doing and really question the paradigm of engineering in a vacuum and then throwing it in and hoping it goes okay. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions. If I, I have two minutes for questions, I made it. I did it. Wow. Oh. So Casey, that was a very interesting and very thought-provoking presentation. So I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So let me uh, see who wants to go first. Yes, Arka, please. Yeah, so, uh, since the project and the, and the research. Yeah, since it involves a lot of community engagement, I wanted to know when you first arrived there, did you face, you know, a lot of skepticism from, from the community? As in, uh, whether this will actually be beneficial for them and how do you convince them to participate in the research? Two different things, yes. Because engineers like to say that they're gonna work with communities and get community feedback. We go give them a survey, we disappear and never go back. Happen, and we're like, oh, we did participatory involvement. We did that survey. We got feedback. That, and so that happens. There's a lot of research fatigue in, in communities. So it takes some trust to build. You gotta show up. You gotta show up over and over again. Um, it helped that I was from Alaska. They don't like outsiders. Um, I'm from Anchorage, which was a problem even in itself. But when I said I was from the University of Texas, they're like, why are you coming here? And I said, oh, I grew up there. And they're like, oh, OK. 
And then um, I, um, I hired somebody locally. It was actually my brother's best friend. I've known him since I was four. He actually lives in that region now as a community outreach specialist, very luckily. That's one of the reasons why we're there. So when we're not in there in between, he has hired to maintain those relationships and communications and make sure they're culturally relevant. So we make sure we're rooting it with people that are trusted and we have those check gates before we work with the community to make sure we're not doing harm. We also show up over and over again. I can't tell you how surprised a couple of those communities were that we were back. Just to say hi. You have to show up. You have to show up or else you fracture those relationships. And now after you know doing this for years, my team is known as one that does show up for communities and will follow through. Um, Dr. Abraham used to say, under promise, over deliver. She used to always tell me that. And we, I tell my students that and they do for the communities. Under promise, over deliver. If they want something that is maybe tangentially aligned with my research, but it will help them, we will do it. We'll put some, because that relationship matters. They wanted a presentation to educate the, the community on the real cost behind delivering water. Did it really have something to do? No, but it was good for us and it was good for our community building. We did it. They're thrilled. They wanted us to add something into our interviews to talk about affordability. Okay, easy. Then we synthesized the results and we gave it back to them and they're thrilled. So meaningful relationships takes time and you have to take care to maintain them because if you go in and do a survey and think that you worked with the community, it's rubbish and that's why um, it's not, that's why communities don't wanna work with a lot of engineers or people. So it's, uh, but I, the way I've gotten around with that because we've been so busy and have so many projects, I make sure I hire somebody to maintain those relationships on the ground on our behalf because um, I know that I don't have the capacity right now with like um, my career and my season of life with kids to travel all the time and stuff like that. So um, I hire help to make sure those relationships are cared for properly. Great question. Yes, Dr. You know, I always ask questions. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for an exciting and uh, a very insightful presentation. And I was quite intrigued by the use of your um, graphic comics. I'm sorry? You're not speaking loud enough. They want to the microphone. I know. I'm surprised, too. Here. I'm surprised, too. So um, I was intrigued by the use of, uh, by the creation and the use of your graphic novels mm -hmm. or, you know, using graphics to be able to educate and um, educate as well as get information. Um, from operators and through, uh, to operators. Have you also used the same technique to educate the children in the community? Because one of the areas that I'm quite passionate about is how do we also um, you know, educate the workforce of the future? So can you speak a little bit about that? Not on this project. So we do educate that we work with the community because in Alaska, they say you want to engage a community, you engage our youth. Yeah. So we do community outreach, but not for that. But we have a different project actually um for through the strengthening america infrastructure nsf that's in el paso looking at um messaging because when we when you get a message from the utility that says conserve water everybody what that uh -huh. effectively is saying is our storage is depleting faster than we can treat it and we don't want to depressurize the system and um you know put everybody on a boil water alert right and so they don't say that they just say hey, everybody conserve water please right so that they 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 require community um cooperation to uh re-put the system back into tolerance um design tolerance is what that's happening now in communities where that are where the dominant language is not always english that messaging is not always clear and so we're working actually with um YMCA and Girl Scouts of America in El Paso to look at children who function as language brokers for their uh, households when they're if parents don't speak English and that's a language their bills and messaging are coming from. And we are working with um, them to look at for winter preparedness, how do we deliver messages that are accessible to fifth and sixth graders that are language brokers functionally in the system to allow um, this information to go back and visualizations is one of them. So yes, but not through this project. And we're at the very beginning of this, we're actually going out to El Paso next two weeks, next week, 25th, whenever that is, um, to do some initial focus groups through YMCA and Girl Scouts and other organizations to really understand how children function as language brokers and how to deliver technical information in a way they can convey to their parents. Um, because the reality is that's the role a lot of people play in first gen households, so. Well, I know that we have a lot of more questions here in the audience, but let me go to our online participants and see if there's any question there. I cannot see who's online today, so if you have a question, please. Unmute and ask a question. 
I'm not hearing any. So let me go over to, I think somebody had a question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, uh, press, press the microphone button and then speak. All right, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. Um, I kind of have kind of two questions infused in one. Um, the first question was one of the things I answered with regards to the fact that the community did not trust the source of treated water that they have. Mm -hmm. So the first question would be how can you improve that in the sense that the community can actually accept that. The other one with regards to some of the challenges they were facing was the fact that um, um, the local knowledge of the people there are not being taken into account into water management. So how can you ensure that the people that should be providing this access of water to them actually take into consideration their own local knowledge of what is actually happening. So two different things I'm going to go on it. So the first one was about um, trusting the water. Is that correct? This is a big public health issue they've been working on for decades there. It's a big challenge. One of the things Dr. Katz, Lynn Katz is working on, and we're still in the middle of finishing up the water quality testing is looking at ways uh, that we can remove the chlorine taste through filters, um, charcoal filters. I'm This is her area, so I might be explaining things wrong, but she's looking at places that once you get the treated water, you can remove the taste of chemicals while maintaining it. And um, with, that is one of the things we we're hoping to do next in the next year once we get through this for the tank maintenance for that reason. However, I can say it's been a big um, cultural slash public health tension in the region in rural Alaska, I shouldn't say the region, it's all over Alaska, uh, for quite some time. Um, and they've been trying various things. Uh, so it's, I think it's going to be something that's ongoing. Uh, what was your second question? It was about the knowledge. Two things. We're co-designing everything. We are listening and we are facilitating what they would like to include in terms of their training and education. The other thing we're actually doing next summer that I'm really excited about is we are doing um, sites and stories where we're going to sit down and we, they, we do these traditional knowledge sessions with elders and tribal communities where we sit down and we just say, tell me about water infrastructure. Tell me the stories. And we've got some stories in there that have been really cool. One of them is about water conservation. And um, they, there's, a, uh, there's some stories about how Generations ago, um, we, our elders you had, drank very little water, very little water, and they stayed warm. They had very thin gloves. And then the next generation needed a little bit more water, and their gloves got thicker and thicker, and it goes generation by generation. And now these waters, these kids, they need so much water, and they can't go outside because they're cold. And like, so there's these like stories that we're hearing that how they actually encourage different behaviors like water conservation, because when you pack ice, you know, you're using one to four gallons per capita per day, right? Um, very, very different ones, and the, like, this, uh, these stories are how those cultural relationships with water use come out. And so we've been capturing some of those to understand how do we get systems in that align with these needs, as well as public health goals. But we're going to be capturing more of those. We're just going to we're hoping to get some history also about like the post-colonial development of water because. There's a lot of systems thrust into these rural environments that they don't want, and now they're stuck maintaining. So how can we do some corrective action with, through capital projects to get them back to something that's more sustainable? Um, so we're in the middle of that, but right now we are making sure we're co-designing everything through the images, the stories, the delivery with these graphic guides. Like my students are just facilitating the vision of the drivers, essentially. We're facilitators. Uh, are you the as this is a very like complex issue so are you the ones only ones that are working there or are there any uh, national or multinational companies or organizations already working there in some instances there are a lot of there's a lot of ngos and stuff that go there and leave not necessarily each one of these very small communities but in a lot of the hub communities people are in and out there's a lot of federal funding coming here um researchers there's a couple other teams in other regions of alaska that we coordinate with uh but it's a very complex issue i would say but in our couple of our communities we're the only ones there but in other ones there are other players there and we want to coordinate with them. We want, we want to coordinate resources and reduce the burden on communities. It's not a competition, right? We can do better work together. Unlike that point of view where I showed you the perspectives of water services, like it, we want, our goal is the better provision of services. It's not to somehow lead the way. Like I'm, I'm the most comfortable if I'm the person, uh, if there's a theater show, I'm the one doing the lights that nobody knows I'm there. Like that's what I'm most comfortable in, right? So we want to work with those individuals and we are. So we're doing a lot of work with like the tribal entities, the um, different NGOs, the city councils and everything like that. So, but in some instances they're there, some instances they're not. Any other questions? Thanks for the presentation. It was like, oh.
it was from a very ground level perspective like practical application so that was good so i just had one question so the challenges and all the synergies that you mentioned mm-hmm. are they also transferable to other communities with even lesser resources as compared to us yes um, and I'm going to start with transferable to other uh, villages in Alaska. We are creating templates for everything that we're doing so people can adapt it. We're going to test it and then we will comply. We will give the state, local, regional, and I'll make it available on like websites or whatever um, and archive everything we're doing so people can use it and adapt it for their own needs. Uh, we see a lot of this in um, developing context. So the challenge with America the, in rural Alaska is it is a developing context constrained by a developed nation's regulations, mm-hmm. which creates a lot of challenges for our projects and what we can do and what we can't do. But at the root of it, the workforce issues, the reason why they like working with our researchers is because we're not bound by a lot of these jurisdictional constraints and these policy constraints, we can explore the research and say, okay, we're going to not use Western knowledge, we're going to use local knowledge. And we can do that as researchers. So the communities are using us to be able to look at a lot of this stuff. And it is very, um, we've been doing some of this work, Uh, we've worked with some communities in Kenya and Colombia in um, the colonias in Texas, so a lot more developing countries. So yeah, absolutely. Cambodia, like, yeah. We still have time for a few more questions. Uh, your network map was very interesting, showing what things worked against uh, others. Um, and one of the things that I noticed was that as operators got training on uh, delivering I mean, water, we're talking. Um, there was a positive correlation of them going to what seemed to be another jurisdiction. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas you have other Which one uh, are you talking about? Where, where this? Uh, national operator mm-hmm. training to that one's all right. That's all right, fine. One's... To operator license reciprocity. Yep. So they, if there's reciprocity, that means they go to some other location, as opposed to national operator training with operator retention. So are you w- looking at changing how? getting swapping the colors of those arrows so the polarity remember is just how they change together and that one's actually has two embedded in it for simplest simplicity so one thing national operator certification for reciprocity after you go up the classes for your certification you can manage bigger systems which means a lot a lot of times you'll start being a um a remote work a remote work person so you'll live in a hub community and you'll travel to the communities and help out different ones essentially, um, to simplify it. Now, the other thing is if we can lower the um, certification standards to align with the systems in Alaska, we can increase retention. So that's one's that way too. So that's what a lot, so uh, we can't fit, these factors, a lot of these are embedded for simplicity for the, just conveying the information, but there's sometimes a couple factors in there. So that's really what's going on there. Um, the we have a lot of remote workforce in alaska that live in hub communities and when something happens like with a water infrastructure system they have to call the rmws to go out there because they can make the actual decisions and tweaks and you can only do so much on the ground sometimes you're waiting a week for somebody to come fix it um there's a lot of even hub communities that are doing i call it the slope model has anybody uh, familiar with like the oil fields uh, rotation and workforce you go two weeks on you go up there and then you come back for two weeks uh we I we just colloquially in Alaska we call it the slope model. A lot of my friends are slope workers, and they will. Um, there is above some of like the plants that they will actually have a bunkhouse, and they will pay somebody a lot of money to go live there for two weeks and rotate operators, especially during hunting season and stuff. Um, so that reciprocity uh, allows you to, as you go up, you can work with other systems that are bigger. So it's Sometimes, and sometimes we're actually getting people from Georgia randomly and like some other places. So, I mean, it's a, so one third, at, I don't know if the statistic's still true, when uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, only one third of Alaska's engineers lived in Alaska. So, a lot of people commute to Alaska from the lower 48 for two weeks on, two weeks off. So, they'll we'll fly up there, do their two weeks gig, um, sleep in the dorms up on the North Slope, come back for two weeks and do back and forth. So it's, I mean, it's pretty common. Like my husband's family um, used to live in Papua New Guinea and a lot of people commute from Australia to Papua New Guinea, for instance, and they go on Monday and come back on Friday. And so um, it's that same kind of model. That's pretty common. So do they do that in both seasons or just? Oh yeah, because there's a shortage. We have, the water industry is th- it has a 30% uh, um, shortage of 
operators nationwide. It's a problem. It's one of the, if you look at American Water Works puts in like the most pressing issues every year and like workforce has been inching its way up. We have a big workforce shortage, big, big shortage. Great career to be in. We got a lot of power, a lot of mobility. Any more questions? Yes, um, For the network diagram, it seems a, a combination of a qua quantitative factors as well as quali uh, qualitative. Uh -huh. So in future, are you planning to like create a financial model out of it uh, or? We are not doing a financial model. It is called the semi-cognitive map. Um, so exactly, it is. It is the polarity allows you to have um, some quantification that can change by degrees. A lot of times, this is this makes its way into different types of models. So, for instance, we have one project where it is we're looking at the cost of controversy on um, renewable energy projects and whether or not we should address it or not to try to speed up the energy transition. And this model served as the beginning of an agent-based system dynamics model to test it, for instance. So um, this is, you could think about this as a causal loop diagram that extends to institutional factors as well and organizational factors. Um, so sometimes we don't, we just need to be able to see how levers will cascade through the system and this is all we need. Other times we bring it into a more complex modeling environment um, if we need that. So for this particular project, we don't, we just need to know how these levers are connected and how they will impact other ones. Um, in other projects, we bring it into a, um, a purely mathematical model that people can plug and play and do scenario analysis with. Yeah. Wait, any, any other questions? All right, well, as always, I, I take the privilege of asking the last question. So let me do that. Uh, so, Casey, I think this was very interesting. You can see from the number of questions that Nobody fell asleep. were raised. Nobody fell asleep. Nobody fell asleep, exactly, right? So, right. essentially, you talked about two things. The one is Kasky of water. Second is the degradation of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, I have a two-part question. Number one is what are the sources of funding for infrastructure rehabilitation? Because it seems to be getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. So like gas tax or you know, what, what, are, what are the different mechanisms uh, in Alaska that are being explored for uh, funding? That's one. And second, you mentioned about uh, the permafrost uh, melting. Mm -hmm. Is that being conserved in terms of water? The, uh, okay, so let's start with the funding one. Um, they are not, the, a lot of these systems are not self-sustaining because of the cash economy and people maybe have $12,000 per year annual salary. There's not a lot of industries out here, as you might guess. Um, and so funding is a big problem because they're not, they, the price of water, it's not, the systems are not self-sustaining. So they are applying for a lot of funds at the federal and state level. The problem is, and if you look at some, there's some articles coming out of this region, actually, they missed a lot of the federal funding by a couple points because they, and guess what, an operate, a certified operator is only a couple points. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's this carrot and stick. And so they're actually, um, the funding is for communities like this that we're in, but they're not able to access the funding because of the stage gates that they use to try to get people like upgrade in place theoretically, right? But like, you can't have a certified operator. It's it's prohibitive pretty much, right? And so in a lot of places. And so they actually can't access a lot of the funding at the federal level or even sometimes the state level, but a lot of it's coming at that time. And to be honest, a lot of times people get like a new water treatment plan or something when there's a catastrophic failure. That's how it happens, you know, emergency funds then open up. Um, some a, a pipe uh, froze and they tried to thaw it with a torch because that's what they typically do. And there's a fire and there goes a water treatment plant. Um, so things like that is what can happen. Uh, so the funding is, it, one of the other problems is in order to apply for outside funding, you have to have somebody with the knowledge on how to apply for outside funding. And the, a lot of the city governance structures don't have that knowledge. So you have to have somebody that can come in from the outside a lot of time to help. And that is really your ability to apply is actually a privilege that a lot of people don't have at the community level. So it's just kind of um, the regional corporations come in and help as they can kind of to offset the cost and subsidize the cost. So it's not, it's kind of a mess a little bit. Um, the other question was about permafrost and uh, the thaw, um, the changing everything. I mean, everything's eroding. There's now a liquid where there wasn't before. Whole lot of challenges there. Um, I have not seen anybody looking at water recovery per se. I don't know if it's happening, but I do know that in a general world, there's a lot of people looking at the changing um, quality of the water source, which is then changing how we treat water and where we can get water from. So 
indirectly it's impacting that, but I haven't seen anybody looking at the volume change because effectively they can treat the, they're, they're adjusting their water, the amount of water they treat based on the community demands and the community demands are being triggered by what they can afford. So it's not a access to quantity really per se, it's more of a, how do we treat what we have? So that I would say that's where I've seen most of the work. So. Just a quick follow-up question on that. Uh, you also mentioned that because uh, the permafrost melting, there are new bodies of water suddenly being created next to the water mm -hmm. well and, and things of that kind. So that must be raising a whole lot of them. You did mention health mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. So isn't it compounding that you have infrastructure that is crumbling? Oh, yeah. Permafrost melting, health issues because of uh, mm -hmm. stagnant water and so on. Yep. So uh, this seems to be a cascading problem. Yeah, oh, it's a huge problem. It's a okay. wicked huge problem. So uh, is, is the federal agencies providing funds to the state to take care of some of these issues? Yes, but they're not talking together very well. Like I gave you the example of they gave one community relocation funds while they're building a very expensive water treatment plant on melting permafrost like that they're, they're one hand's not talking to another so it's not efficient use of resources and a lot of times it doesn't make it down to the community um there's a lot of which is a huge huge problem a lot of conversation about relocating but there's been one community of course right now i'm drawing blanks i'm standing right here that they tried to relocate well they did relocate and they everyone hails it as a success story of relocating a community in alaska but, but let me tell you they started conversations of relocating that when i was in elementary school it took 20 it took over 20 years and there's still portions that haven't moved and i actually got up at a conference because there was a bunch of people who were not from alaska being like look we did it we have relocated a community and i was like you guys were talking about this when i was in second grade like if you start these communities now you don't have 20 20 years like that's not there and then they're like oh yeah but you don't understand all the bureaucratic mess i said i don't care figure that out like you can't say this is a success because it is now it's a failure like how in any how in any like metric is this a success and they stopped asking me questions and ended the session <laughs> um so that's kind of one of the answers we should move people but it's not it hasn't been practically shown that they can do that so so let's take that as a cue <laughs> <laughs> this session as well yeah. please give it a big round <laughs> thanks for having me this was fun <laughs> Thanks for not falling asleep, everyone. <laughs>